good friend of mine. She's on our operating committee. Uh, occupation mechanical engineer, correct? And doing some wonderful things over at Stark State. And uh, this is a pretty exciting, uh, pretty exciting session. Yes. Uh, you know what? I did not print off extras, but uh, why don't you guys share, and then I will I will make sure I bring some extras next next session. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Shear. So I'm uh, going to be talking about um, mechanical engineering a little bit and in engineering as a whole. And then I actually brought some kits so we can do a little fuel cell uh, kind of solar experiment um, later if time allows. And uh, if not, we can do it during the exchange period. Um, so I wanted to just uh, verify um, how much time do we have? Now we're in 20 minutes. Oh, we've got plenty of time then. So we'll definitely have time for an the experiment then. And hopefully the things will be done. All right, yeah. So um, you've, you've met with a few engineers already. So you, you know that, in, in fact, um, the definition by Webster's of an engineer is that engineering is the application of math and science by which the properties of matter and the source of energy in nature are made useful to people. Now, in fact, this, this is a very apropos definition because today I'm also going to be talking to you a bit about careers in the energy sector. So um, it's, it's great that it, it talks about sources of energy right in, in the main definition of, of engineering. <laughs> So really, engineers come in, in, in many, many different forms. As, as you've already seen, I think you've met at least four or five engineers already uh, through the, the, the course of, of your studies here so far. Uh, but above all, what you'll find and, and what you've seen is engineers are really problem solvers who really make things and processes better. And if we can't fix it, we'll create something new. So that's another aspect of, of uh, engineering. And the salaries, quite frankly, uh, for those with a Bachelor's of Science in, in Engineering uh, tend to be extremely good. Uh, my career has been uh, just an excellent uh, process of continuous improvement. I have lived in eight states. I have visited five of the seven continents. Uh, it's been quite an exciting career. Uh, so I can, I can say that engineering and particularly the bearing industry has been very, very good to me. And what you can also see is that depending on your level of education, and this is actually true of, of many different fields of study, the higher your, your level of education, typically the higher your, your wages are going to be. And the major disciplines of engineering, of course, are uh, mechanical, electrical, chemical, civil, and industrial. But in fact, they, the engineering fields can cross into so many different areas, such as automotive, aerospace, agriculture, uh, biomedical, computers, uh, environmental materials, uh, nuclear, robotics, and safety. Just to mention a few, but there really are hundreds of different ones. So today, um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on mechanical and mechanical electrical related to my own experience, uh, both in the past and, and currently. So this is where um, what I'd like to do first is to play uh, the Career Day video because it, 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 is, uh, it was created by Timken and it shows very clearly uh, many of the different aspects of engineering from, from someone who would be in the bearing industry. So let's go ahead and if, uh, if for some reason the sound doesn't play, I do have speakers on go ahead. Oh, you know what? I probably um, 
which is the internet connection? Um, or is there an internet connection? Your friend, the IT guy, we yep. need him. <laughs> yeah, and actually, what you need it's to do also more is evidence to than you can. Yeah. Sitting there going, boy, I wish he was in the room. <laughs> <laughs> It took a lot of other 
fields of study to succeed in that accomplishment as well. They all work together. But quite frankly, without the engineers, it wouldn't have happened in the first place. So it is so, and so, so important. So I'm going to be talking a little bit now about um, the specific field of, of energy and as it relates to some of the curriculum that we have at Stark State College. Um, as you saw from my bio, I'm the Director of Fuel Cell and Alternative Energy Technologies. And so that is, is my, my current role. We saw from my past record is I've also had a very long career in the bearing industry, globally. So my, my master's is, is from the Rotterdam School of Management in the Netherlands. That was a lot of fun, having being able to work and live overseas and being able to manage a group of, of international employees from all different countries, testing and developing new products in the bearing industry. That was my career with, with SKF. When I came to Timken then, I moved on into product management and then the management of the, the change, management of change group, which is so important. If you can imagine that you have one product being made in as many as six different factories, and that product could go into a Ford, a Chrysler, or GM vehicle that's produced in any one of those countries. And that product has to react and, and um, live and, and, and be sustained and strong um, and have meet the same warranty criteria no matter where that product is made. As well, you know, every bearing has its own little signature. So if, if the product has a little bit of vibration in it produced in one factory, the motor that that bearing is in is going to have a different signature. So this is why standards and, and control and uniformity across the globe is so important. So that's why I was part of a global management of change initiative to ensure that if one factory in, that had the design control of a particular product was making a change, that every other division that was related to that product would know about that change and everything would be coordinated so that they wouldn't have a tremendous amount of excess products that would be obsolete by the time the change was initiated or certain components of that product would become obsolete and, and <coughs> scrapped as that change was initiated. So managing changes is pretty important. But now I'll come back to my current role in, uh, in Stark State College. So I um, am the Director of Fuel Cell and Alternative Energy Technologies. So within that role, we have supported many, many different initiatives. The largest being, um, of course, if you've been on campus, the, the building of the, the LG Fuel Cell Systems Prototyping Center. Today I'm going to walk you through a little bit about what that was about, and what that company does, and what kind of opportunities are there for engineers. Another large initiative that I've been part of for the last five years is the NSF Great Lakes Fuel Cell Education Partnership. This partnership is a collaboration among six different schools in 11 states to develop the engineering curriculum for fuel cells and electrochemical processes so that the engineers of today can meet the needs of industry tomorrow. Other projects that we've been engaged in are uh, within the, the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, um, and then, of course, the Wind Energy Center, the Timken Technology Test Center that you'll see up near the airport when you're driving up uh, Frank, Frank Road, and um, ShaleNet, which is in the oil and gas industry. Okay. So our current profile in energy today is such that you can see our, our supplies come predominantly from oil and coal and natural gas, certain percentage of nuclear. Then in the renewable energies, we have the groupings of hydro, wind, solar, biomass, and geothermal. 
Now this is America's profile as a whole. If you look at the Ohio profile, it's a bit different. You see a lot more coal in, in that mix. And what you also see in our forecasting of the energy profile is that the demand for energy is ever increasing. And the problem is, the challenge is that we want to be less dependent on foreign oils, but at the same time, our demand profile is increasing, and we also know that ultimately, fossil fuels are actually finite, and we're consuming them at a rate that is, is greater than the Earth is restoring them. So we need to look at alternative energies. And fuel cell technology is one such means of, of conservation. Now, if we look at the Ohio profile directly, you see coal-fired burning plants stand out dramatically as far as what is, is the where's our energy coming from here in Ohio. Um, next, you'll see the, the natural gas-fired generation. And then thirdly, the, the nuclear. Those are the, the, the kind of the big three in Ohio re regarding energy production. So, in a, so overall, our genera generation um, actually shifted a bit from that earlier slide, which I think was from 2009. 2011, we're at 77% from coal, 11% from nuclear, and 9% from natural gas. And I have to say, as you all know, we're in the mecca of natural gas, so you're going to see that number increasing. One of the initiatives in the state that's driving careers in, in alternative energy, as well as improving our profile of our energy generation, is the initiative in the state that will be at 25 by 25. You'll be hearing a lot more about this during the next years, but this is actually what is helping to drive as well incentives for industry to, to move towards renewable and advanced energies. So the plan is that by the year 2025, 12.5% of our energy generation is going to be from renewable energies, and 25% or 12.5% would be from the advanced energies. So this will ultimately lead to a better use of our resources, less use of the, the resources that cause other problems, such as emissions and, and so forth. Um, and it will also give us much more security because we'll be moving from centralized large plants transmitting power over long distances with, with losses to decentralized uh, resources that are smaller plants serving a network areas within the, within the state. Because of these changes, there's tremendous new job opportunities for all of you as you go on to your, your engineering degrees or IT degrees or, or other um, types of degrees uh, related to the opportunities that will be coming in this power uh, industry. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm familiar with most of the terms on this slide except for cogen. What does that stand for? Um, Cogeneration is um, uh, when you, you actually have two processes working at the same time. Um, so, um, you know, I could act, I, I can I can pull specific references for you to, to show you specific okay. examples. Right. Um, there's not really time to go into that That's right fine. now, um, but we we will. Um, I, I can okay. send you more details mm -hmm. on that. Sure. Um, as a, as a little bit of an example, we have systems that are combined heat and power. So you can have systems that are actually performing two, two energy tasks at the same time. Oh, so one's sapping up like the heat entropy of the other or something like that. Yeah, okay. so you can, you can actually, you, um, and when I get to the LG fuel cell system, I'm going to actually explain such a process as okay. that, where you have a high temperature process that, that yields heat in the process that then is reused within the process, okay. or it can also be used for other productive means. So, um, so now I'd like to talk about some of the, the, the different um, areas of the campus where we, we're, we're training and, and, and developing the engineering um, in different fields. 
So this is the picture of the technology test center that's at the corner of Schufel and Frank. How many of you have driven by that? Anybody notice it? Okay. Um, it's, it's yeah, really how many of you have been to the Stark State campus? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have been in the fuel cell center? Okay, handful. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll be, I won't be going inside that center, but I'll actually be telling you more about that center as, as we go forward. So at the, the Technology Test Center, we're, we're, um, it's a collaboration with Timken and Stark State. And at the upper level, which you see from the parking lot, we have a beautiful uh, lab and classroom and conference room for holding classes and also um, being able to, to have meetings and so forth. And in the lower floor of that building, Timken has a, 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 a MTS machine which can do dynamic loading situations on the main bearings for large wind turbines. Wind turbines in the size range of producing 2.5 to 3 megawatt plus um, power. So it's a very large machine. And the whole building actually was built around that machine. And a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was a month ago, you saw um, uh, some of the large construction projects that, that one of the engineers that presented was a part of. The infrastructure for this building was that um, much of an engineering feat as well because they had to put in the supports of what would be just like building a three or actually three to 10 megawatt scale wind turbine. So the rebar and the construction for the support of that machine was an engineering feat in itself. And the reason why all of that rebar and, and construction was necessary was that that machine had to be totally separate from the whole building. Because otherwise, when you put a load on something, you have an equal and opposite reaction load. Which means that all of those loads on that machine have to be um, taken up to the ground and separate from the building. Otherwise, the building would fall down, <laughs> being cycled and cycled so many times. So this was, was really quite an engineering feat. If you go to the Stark State website, you can actually see pictures of the construction from the start to the finish. But we're not talking about construction today, so I'm going to move on. Now, this is why that machine was built. If you look at the sizes of wind turbines over time, you see a marked increase in the size of those, those wind turbines. And in fact, when you get above a 2.5 megawatt scale wind turbine, that's when you start to see tapered roller bearings as the main bearings in the turbine. And that's why Timken was very interested in developing the best, the best bearing in the world for this application. So this picture kind of shows you what those different types of bearings are depending on, on where you're at. So in the smaller range, below 2.5 megawatts, you see a spherical roller bearing as the main bearing. And that a spherical roller bearing um, has rollers that look like little barrels. And the raceway is curved over those, those curved rollers. And the reason why that bearing is popular in, in those size ranges is that one of the advantages of a spherical roller bearing is that it can take dynamic misalignment. So the bearing can roll, but also take those shifts that occur because of the loading and the variability that happens when you can imagine the gusts of the wind is changing. Um, so that's why spherical roller bearings are so popular in the lower sizes. But it's, it's a blessing and a curse that it can do both, take the, the loads and take the, be dynamically misaligned, in that whenever something misaligns as it's rotating, you have a little bit of sliding. And because of that sliding, you have wear between the two components. And so for that reason, when you get above the 2.5 megawatt, you start to see loads which by that, that this type of bearing just can't handle that kind of loading. So you need to take those loads in, in, a, 
in a better way and, and assure as best as possible the true rolling, because with true rolling then you have the lubrication between the, the, the meeting components and the, the bearings can live that much longer. And of course these turbine, the nacelle of the turbine can be 325 feet in the air. So you certainly don't want those bearings to fail and have to come in with a helicopter <laughs> and some very uh, incredible uh, wind cowboys <laughs> to come in to, to disassemble the motor in the air and, and bring it out, or worse, have to remove the whole nacelle, carry it over, bring it to the ground, and then do maintenance. It's not very economical. So you want those bearings to go, uh, to run for 30 years without any failures. So you can imagine that not only is it important to have the right product, that takes engineering know-how to understand all of the loads and the situations that that bearing is going to see, but also the right preventive and planned maintenance on that product so that it's not going to fail after the fifth year because you forgot to grease it, you forgot to, to lubricate the, uh, the components. No, it's, it's yeah, very important. Now this is a picture of some of the types of equipment that we have in the, that technology test center. We see on the left, is a, is a wind turbine simulation machine. In fact, it's basically a robot that looks like a wind turbine. <laughs> because, of course, we are not driving the system by the wind. Instead, we're driving it by power so that we can see how all the components work. So if you, if you um, put energy into a motor, and drive it like, for instance, from the wind, it becomes a generator. If you take energy from the motor, then it's basically the motor. So, um, so here we are, are basically running a wind turbine that is a motor because we, don't, we can't have the wind to be able to, to rotate that uh, on the inside, but we can simulate all the components and understand the process. So here, instead of generating energy, we're actually using energy, but at least you get a good idea of all the components that go into the construction, the gearing, the, the, um, the yaw mechanisms, and, and pitches for the blades, and so forth. And on the next uh, slot, um, picture on the right is a general purpose electrical trainer. Because in um, the wind turbine industry, it's critical that the technicians understand alternating current, direct current, and, and all of the different switches and controls that, that are related to transmitting and, and uh, generating energy. So um, I told you that I'd speak a little bit about the fuel cell center. How many of you, or if, does anyone here know what a fuel cell is? Yeah. Jordan, do you want to? Isn't it kind of like it harnesses like hydrogen? It's kind of an energy source? It can. It can. Um, a fuel cell is a means of producing um, power electrochemically. So we'll get a chance to do some hands-on experiments as, as I finish the, the presentation. Now our relationship in the fuel cell industry actually dates back to 2003. Some of you have been to the um, the prototyping center and the fuel cell center. What you might not know, if you haven't been to LG fuel cell systems, is that attached to our fuel cell lab is a whole factory, a prototyping center, that's actually building a one megawatt scale solid oxide fuel cell system. And I'm going to be um, showing you in a little um, bit exactly what a, a fuel cell system is and how it works and how the different technologies work. So this relationship started back in, in 2003. And at that time, the state realized that if we do not go forward with supporting emerging technologies to improve our energy efficiency, then we are really going to have a, a huge problem in the state. Because we are a huge manufacturing state. We use a lot of energy, and because we use a lot of energy, we emit a lot of NOx and SOx and CO2 or carbon monoxide and 
so forth. So, so we really have to be careful to, to preserve our environment. So what happened was the state said, okay, we're going to, to fund and support public-private partnerships. So they, we built a prototyping center that was basically an incubator for new companies to develop their technologies so that in the future we would have a next generation of power generation. Did the state work with any other colleges? All over, all over the states. Yeah, yeah. So it is, it is really awesome. Um, so this was the first center that was built. It was purely a, a incubator. Stark State didn't have any space inside this building. It was all companies. And fortunate for us. The first two companies to occupy that space were the engineers from Rolls-Royce and Softco. And very quickly, the two companies realized, wow, together, we can change the world. <laughs> Seriously. Because one had a fuel processing expertise that was really incredible. And one had a fuel cell technology that was just as incredible. So they decided, hey, Stark State, we don't want you to let anybody else come into these bays. We want to lock the doors. We're becoming one. And Rolls-Royce bought Softco. And that's the same Rolls-Royce that makes jet engines. The same Rolls-Royce's name that's on vehicles, but they're not really, Rolls-Royce really isn't in the vehicle business. They sold that brand. <laughs> but they're really known for their jet engines and propulsion. So the next step was, okay, we're, now we need to build a prototyping center. So we have this great technology that we have, have tested and verified in a smaller scale. Now we need to increase that. Now as I'm talking about this to you, Kind of hear a lot of engineers in your mind. <laughs> there was a lot of engineers that, that, that made this all happen. So what um, the next expansion was in 2009, we actually added 23,000 square feet so that they could put in their prototyping center. Is yeah. the project like given to one company and then like that company calls other people like to come in and help them work it? Actually, in this case, this was developed by the company itself. So the reason why um, they needed to expand mm -hmm. is that Rolls-Royce actually had centers for fuel cell development in England and Singapore. But they realized that this technology in marriage with Softco was ground, uh, really just revolutionary. So they shut down, for the most part, their operations in England and in Singapore and they moved all of the test equipment from those locations to North Canton, Ohio, and installed it in this new building that was built. And then made this the world headquarters for Rolls-Royce fuel cell systems. Now the benefit to Stark State in this expansion was, you see the little green area um, in, in the corner? That's when our fuel cell lab was built. Because they also realized that we have so many, we have just this number of people that know about fuel cells, but we need the next generation of engineers because we're growing and nobody knows anything about fuel cells for the most part. Even though they've been out in the market for over 50 years, this technology was brand new. So we really needed to develop curriculum and expand. And this is where the project that, that I am on kind of started. There was a, a pre-project before my NSF Great Lakes Fuel Cell Education Partnership that helped to, to develop the first curriculum for these engineers that then were interns at Rolls-Royce, and many of them now are full-time employees at Rolls-Royce. So then they realized, okay, this technology has been tested out. It, it really is proving successful. We're getting closer to commercialization. We need 30 more engineers. We need to expand. We also need capital. We need an integrator partner. So, what happened? LG partnered with Rolls-Royce, and you now have 
LG Fuel Cell Systems Incorporated, which is 49% owned by Rolls-Royce and 51% owned by LG. The same LG that you might see on your television, on your dishwasher, on your washing machine, on all kinds of different electronic components. So, can you imagine what sort of expertise LG brought to the table? Looking back to the slides of the kinds of engineering jobs that so many, there's so many different types. Supply chain, logistics, manufacturing. So, so it really was a good marriage. And also, another increase in opportunities for engineering. So, up in the, the corner, you see they added, surrounded by yellow, the engineering offices for that commercialization team. That's the team that is designing the, the, the overall package for the system that, that has been developed. They're doing the feasibilities on manufacturer ability and repeatability. Because while you can create something and test it and, and verify it, now you're going to need to make a hundred of these. You've got to make sure that the first one is as good as the hundredth one and that the components are, are perfect for each, each one. So it, it really takes not just a handful of engineers, but a little bit of a, a city, <laughs> in a way, a village. And the benefit to this expansion was also that Stark State has another lab now, another thousand square feet, to focus on the renewable energy and, and particularly solar energy and electrical training. So the total facility now is 60,000 square feet. And the kinds of positions that, that are in this building of LG Fuel Cell Systems Inc. are design engineers, manufacturing engineers, manufacturing technicians, controls engineers, uh, test operators, yep. With your facilities being so big, how do you keep track of the, like, the energy is supposed to protect the environment, but the things that live in the environment are being misplaced too when you build your facilities because they're so massive. And if you guys want to do this and it works, then everybody would want to do it. Which would mean well, there'd be hundreds you, you, of you, facilities. Yeah, you, you have to, you're mixing different technologies right now. Um, yes, sometimes birds and bats do get killed by wind turbines. Did you know that more birds and bats get killed by windows? than they do by wind turbines. <laughs> when wind turbines are placed, a tremendous study is done on migratory paths as well as habitats to, to make that impact as low as possible on the environment. Now, frankly, some of the early farms, <coughs> unfortunately, did not do that. And where wind energy got a really huge egg in the face, and it took them back quite a ways, is one of the largest wind farms in the beginning actually was put right in the center of a migratory path, and it was a bloodbath. It was really bad. They learned a lot from that, <laughs> and, and today it won't happen. So, for example, we will not have a wind turbine at the corner of Schufel and Frank. Not because of the airport, because the clearances are okay. But there's a, there's a special protected species of apple bat that lives in the woods behind the, the facility. And we will not take the risk of hurting that habitat for, for that apple bat, or killing that apple bat. So we do take those things into consideration. Now what you'll see is that the, the system that LG is producing isn't that big. It isn't uh, invasive to, to the environment. And, uh, and actually, it protects the environment uh, over coal-fired burning plants. Regardless, so. it's the, the environmental damage done by um, these are negligible compared to coal and natural gas. Exactly, exactly. So, um, this picture gives you an idea of the size and scale of a one megawatt fuel cell system. It is basically the size of a tractor trailer. It's not a big 
generation plant like you're used to seeing. So it really does actually minimize the footprint and minimize the, the impact on the environment. And even better, it doesn't have the NOx and SOx emissions. They're zero. Yes, there are still some, some uh, carbon monoxide uh, exhaust, but not near <laughs> what any other power generation has. And I won't go into detail on the particular system, but I, if anybody wants to talk to, about that separately, I will. So in order to develop those future fuel cell engineers and, um, and technicians, Stark State has um, fuel cell degrees and certificates. The Mechanical Engineering um, Technology Associates degree with a fuel cell major um, is a, a tag curriculum. And many of the engineers that have taken this curriculum have gone on now, and, and I know of at least four engineers at LG that started as students at Stark State that interned engineering internships while they were going to school, went on to Akron U or other colleges and have completed their engineering degrees and are now full-time employees at LG. I know actually of 11 of our students that are full-time employees that didn't necessarily intern with LG, but because of their fuel cell knowledge and because of the, their, their uh, background are now full-time employees. We also have a one-year certificate that's focused on the fuel cell technology for either an engineer who wants to come back to get that special fuel cell knowledge or a engineering technician that would like to, to be able to be a test uh, technician. And we have a, a few um, individuals that are full-time employees at LG now that went through this program and, be, and became fuel cell technicians. And then we have the fuel cell certificate of competency. This is, is predominantly what those returning engineers come back to take because they already have all of the, the curriculum under their belt of, of um, what the, the one-year uh, certificate would have. So they'll come back in just for a specific class or two focused in the fuel cell area. We also have other courses in the Renewable Alternative Energy curriculum that I had mentioned before. So we have a, a Sustainable Alternative um, Wind Energy one-year certificate, and then we have a wind turbine maintenance uh, one-year certificate, and we have um, electrical maintenance technology associates degrees, one with a wind major and another with a solar major. I had mentioned that we, we do have the uh, education partnership that, that is uh, collaboration over six states of 11 different colleges and universities. Um, and our website, which I'm gonna give you each a card that you can visit, has a lot of good educational information about the fuel cell industry and about how the fuel cells work. So I'm gonna kind of page through this because I've got a, a little simulation that I wanna show you. So what I also want to show is that um, there are actually, you know, a lot of people think the hydrogen economy is something way in the future. Truth is, there are hydrogen fuel cell buses already in operation and have been in operation for quite a long time. The challenge we have in Ohio is we don't have the infrastructure, but it will come. It will come. Where are these available? Uh, these buses are already running in uh, places like uh, Washington State, uh, Connecticut, California. Um, Honda, Price, uh, no, Honda, Hyundai, and Toyota are commercializing their hydrogen vehicle in 2015. If we all know about commercialization and, and model years, that means they're actually going to be selling those cars in 2014. And believe it or not, those Honda, some of them are going to be produced in Marysville, Ohio. So I think very soon we're going to be on that hydrogen byway. <laughs> And, and I'm uh, collaborating with SARDA to, to try to gain approval and support for building that hydrogen infrastructure. That question in the corner? Yeah. Um, so this new energy, it brings a lot of change, but one of the things that makes our economy so strong is that we have a lot of oil here. So how do you expect to prevent political pushback from those big groups that generate a lot of money from fossil fuels. Like how do you, like I know there's a need, but money talks a lot in the United States. Well the good thing is that we've got the Department of Energy on our side. So, 
yes, you're right. Oil companies are, are going to push back. It's, it's their bread and butter. But they also realize that there are environmental issues. There are sustainability issues related to supply. So for that reason, you're, you're, you're going to see it moving forward. Is it going to move forward more slowly because of the amount of gas that has been found? Absolutely. Absolutely. That'll, that'll slow down the deployment, but it won't stop it. So, a lot of people think fuel cells is a new technology. The truth is it was actually invented way back in, or identified in, in the 1800s, late, late 1700s, and an actual fuel cell was built by Mr. Grove in, uh, in the 1800s, and further developments uh, by Mr. Mound in uh, 1889. Now, what was holding it back? Cost and emissions from the early ones. And what pushed it forward? And, uh, Mr. Bacon was space. We needed a means of reliably producing power, water, and so forth to support life as we went to the moon. So there was actually a fuel cell right there on board in the Apollo spacecraft that provided that, served that function in the spacecraft. Now, the difference is, again, Technology was there, but the affordability of it at that time wasn't there yet. But we've learned a lot from the space program to make it cost effective so that it can be used on land as well as in, in space. So how does it work? Basically, you use hydrogen at the anode, we, we use a catalyst, we split the electrons from the hydrogen, the hydrogen becomes positively charged, as you see, it reaches the anode, or the, the cathode, merges with the oxygen, O2, and your exhaust is water. So you're producing, the, 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 or you're using the electrons to light the lights, you're basically borrowing the electrons from the hydrogen. And this is a very important concept because when you think about transmission of, of, of energy, you have a lot of transmission losses. So for example, if you have a wind farm in the middle of um, the, the, the farmland, you might not have the grid that goes there. And it costs millions of dollars to lay that infrastructure to then transmit that power. But you have another option. You can use that energy to produce the hydrogen through electrolysis and store the hydrogen and then transport the hydrogen. So that's another option. And the only significant byproduct of a fuel PEM, cell? Of a PEM fuel cell. I'm going to show you another one okay. next. So this is the PEM technology. This technology works very well for portable systems. So the vehicles that are, are hydrogen powered are this kind of technology. The portable systems, the backpacks that the soldiers use will be this kind of system because they're light and, and they're effective. But they're not very effective for major power. So for major power, we need a system that doesn't use hydrogen but uses a combination of other gases or fuels. And the experiment that we're going to do over on the right um, is exactly this type of, of um, system. So the solid oxide fuel cell system is a, is a different technology. So here, uh, what is happening, and, and this is what the LG um, principle is, is that they're taking natural gas, they're synthesizing it, and then ultimately what is passing through the, the 
solid oxide fuel cell tubes is a combination of hydrogen and CO. And what you can see is you get many more electrons that way. And this is how you can get you know, a megawatt scale of power in basically a footprint that's, that's not longer than the length of these tables. So this is, this is, is critical. And it's also uh, extremely reliable and more efficient than other means of, of producing energy. There are also other types of, of fuel cells and I'm not going to go into detail on those, but when I um, met with you last, I gave you a, a sheet from the Department of Energy, and I see, Jack, you have one there. Um, and this has on the back the list of all of the, the different types of fuel cells. And on this, then, you'll see the ones that are appropriate to transportation and those that are for main power generation. Okay. So this is what our grid is going to look like it in the future. You're not going to have just one big central plant supplying all the energy. So um, instead you're going to have combinations of photovoltaics, solar, and so forth. Now this is why we're doing it. If you look at, you have 100% of the energy at the beginning of a coal fire burning plant, you lose 65.5% in the generation itself. So, which means you've got 35% left. You lose another 4.8% in the transmission. Got 30% left. And then when you step it down from those high power lines down to your house, you've got another 5.1% loss. You end up with only 25% of the original potential. With a fuel cell, you're in the neighborhood. You don't have to have those high tr transmission lines you get 60%, and to your socket, you get 55%. So this is why fuel cells are so important. Now I'm gonna send these links separately um, that give you just more um, background. There's some nice simulations of the combination of solar and wind and, and so forth that you can look at here. And also there's some tremendous resources on all of those positions and career opportunities within the energy sector. They predict that within the next 10 years, 50% of the engineers in the utility industry and power sector are going to be retiring. So there's some great opportunities as you come out of college for that. And uh, again, this is just a more background that, that I'll share with you. So, um, is there time to do the experiment or? How much time do you need? Um, it would only take maybe 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. So if everybody'd like to get up, I'll grab a couple of lights and we'll do we'll do a little Okay, how are you doing, Mr. Creel? Uh, you could be with a group, so you separate one and you go with one group, one would you go with the other, and you're just going to watch, you're not going to touch it, so you go with the groups, and you pick out who you want to sit with, okay? Um, hi, honey, you see what I'm doing right now? I'll pick a group for you. this. You just walk around. Let's put this down. Yeah. Okay. Just walk around and walk. We're going to start by filling up the vials to the zero point with distilled water.
such that it's not covered by the, the uh, little plastic uh, half moons that are in the bottom of the. And you're going to put the if, if it's if it's still connected to your fuel cell, you're going to put the black side connected to the H2, and the red side connected to the O2. And again, you want to make sure that that little cutout is not covered up by the the little. Uh, I guess there would be a little bit of quarter moon uh, in the bottom of the. Same size. What are you looking for? No, I didn't know if it came from opposite sides, like from input. To uh, actually, actually, you don't even need to use your monitor for now. Um, pull out your solar panel. Next time. 
Uh, I'm going to have him update this matrix uh, next time it appears. At last count, there were seven individuals in the Campbell group, seven, seven students, that had engineering as a primary career path. And then we had another four individuals for a total of 11 that were interested. Um, how many of you are interested in engineering? Mr. Brunner, do I count you in? Yes. Raise them high for a second. <laughs> Okay, I would encourage you, between Mr. LaRocca and between Ms. Shear, I would encourage you all to uh, use these meetings at the end of these sessions, grab a hold of them, and find out you know, what else you can be doing. They, they are a wealth of knowledge in engineering. Uh, networking uh, is tremendous. One of the jobs we're looking for is with Stark County this year. Uh, with the Stark County engineer. So you should tap into that and uh, take advantage of it, okay? And it, to, to, I will tell you that as we go around the colleges, right, Mr. Bruner, engineering is hot. They are, they are dying for engineering students. There's scholarship money. Uh, they are rolling it out. Grants, yeah. They are absolutely rolling it out. And in STEM, um, and believe me, uh, there is enough exciting positions in engineering. I mean, the more I hear about them, uh, there are wonderful, wonderful uh, careers in engineering. So, and you're all bright, and you're all great in math, or, eh. <laughs> Maybe great isn't the word, right? Great? Yeah. Um, not adequate, no. You're very talented individuals, uh, very good in math, you excel in math. And uh, it's a fine career, so I would encourage you to relook at it. Okay, uh, let's talk about the last seminar, which I did not attend, but um, I understand it went very well. What did you think about the legal uh, seminar that we had? Really liked it. Really liked it over here. Uh, let me let me put it this way. Uh, what was the most surprising thing? you found out during that session? Is there anything that was like, wow, I didn't know that? Um, the necessity of patent law. Necessity of patent law. And uh, Akron is a big leader in that. Um, patent laws, uh, we talked about, is a really high market field. Um, makes a lot of money. It's really being pined after. Um, and Akron has a one of the Catherine's Law Schools, one of the leading in Catherine Law. Okay, that's, that's a lot of us. Thank you. That it's really um, good to get an undergrad in a science based field. Because I always thought like lawyer, get a humanities kind of thing and go to law school, but like this is a physics was it one to get, which is weird for me. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Like, uh, like a physics degree, they said, is a really good uh, degree to get for your undergrad. Which I always thought like humanities for lawyers, mm -hmm. you know, public service. Yeah. So they said the science space is really good to get. Mr. Demchuk talked to, the, to me about that. I was I was kind of surprised. Um, I was kind of surprised at that too. But it it, it does make it does, it does make some sense. EJ, did you have something? I was just gonna say the the way that they talked about um, what ev what everyone's view of a lawyer is, uh, how that's not. What, like how 90% of the time it's not what you're doing, like the TV thing where you're there in the courtroom, they're in the courtroom in front of the jury. Um, that's just, a lot of times it's just not what it's like. It's not, it, although although for some people it is, for a lot of people it's sitting in meeting rooms and boardrooms and researching and reading and mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out the best way to present a case. And then you have the actual, the actual portion of it. Uh, also, how much of law now, um, we talked about this when I, for Goodyear, when a lot of businesses are now making you sign the, uh, the agreements to right. settle out of court, and that's becoming more popular legal mediation, right. uh, where you don't go to court, you don't like, go in front of the jury, you don't necessarily go in front of the jury. Right. It's, it's, right. it's probably one step towards court reform, you know, getting, you're right. Anybody else? Um, how about the format of the presentation? 
Uh, the presenters, um, how they conducted their session. I understand that that was um, very acceptable. Yes? I'll comment on that. Um, yes. I really liked it because they all sat in those high chairs up front. They all sat. And it was, chairs, right? yeah, it was, it was conversational. It was cool. It was, it was, it was, it was panel. It was like panel esque. Like if you go, you know, just panel esque. Like yeah, they well they got it's to talk. A great word. Is that a word? Panel like esque. Like, panel esque. Ask. I don't know. Can I use that? <laughs> 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 In pictures. <laughs> uh, um, letting them us talking, them talking, and then letting us ask questions and kind of have a back and forth yeah. was, uh, was, was, was <laughs> and really nice. a lot of their answers stemmed off each other's. Um, they had different experiences with a lot of the questions. Okay. Well, based on what I heard about that, we bought three chairs that they were sitting on. <laughs> so uh, they'll be here in this meeting room, and uh, we can use that as a format in the future. So good. I'm glad. <laughs> Yeah, I heard it went over very well, and I'm, and I'm glad, and I just want to do a little bit of reflection on that. Does anybody else have anything? Yes. I really liked how at the end, <coughs> kind of, I mean, because I think a lot of us have opinions on it. Um, no, <laughs> no, they don't have opinions. So um, stuff that's, you know, going on in, you know, the Snowden and everything right, else. Right, right. We got yeah. the time at the end, kind of, what we took. Someone took the public side, and a group of us took the government side, and we kind of defended uh, that, that was Fourth Amendment. That was cool, huh? With the participation mm -hmm. that Yeah, which was really cool. Yeah. I really liked that. Yes. I like that too. I just didn't like the side that I was on. <laughs> it just made me see like how lawyers sometimes they get paid to go to um what word do I want to use? I don't know. To defend defend different cases they don't like. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Um, uh, I had a problem with it though because okay, so the exercise is very interesting, but I feel like it could have been done better because for the entire presentation we were talking about how lawyers and how legislation are designed to protect like um, human rights and the rights of the individual. And then we have a project where, okay, we are split up into two different sides of the government and then people who are kind of like not wanting the, um, the government to look at data and stuff. And it was kind of interesting to see how the entire presentation kind of went along the lines of, okay, we're protecting individual rights, now we're going to have an exercise in which we're kind of championing or um, kind of like helping out the individual right group. So I didn't like how the government group had to kind of like scrap and find a reason or an answer that would have either sounded really uber conservative or really uber radical. <laughs> so I feel like it could have been more even or less. Or maybe they could have picked something else like um, a local situation like say uh, Ariel Castro with the whole Cleveland terrible thing that happened to protect his rights even though he is a nut or something a little bit more local. I didn't like the example. You know, I was going to take credit for asking Mr. Denchak to give you uh, that kind of example, but after hearing that, um, I won't take credit for it. <laughs> it's not, it was no, good. I, I understand what you're saying. So you wanted like a point counter, you, want, you wanted maybe two exercises. It could have been done so much more evenly. Okay, okay. I, I'm not sure they got that deep into it, yeah. but I could understand where, where uh, you might think that. Yeah. Okay, all right, good. Um, okay, now, not so good uh, subject is, uh, is uh, the state of uh, absences here in the, uh, in the, camp, uh, in the camp seminars. Um, we, we, we had kind of an increase, and, and Mr. Bruner and Ms. Zosowski and uh, Mrs. Myers and I have decided that uh, we, we, will, we are going to uh, recommit to, to our uh, rules and regulations, which is, um, again, a week before uh, an absence, you must notify Mr. Mr. Bruno and Ms. Lozowski or myself um, uh, that you will not be in attendance. If, if it is an emergency, we understand that, but you have to clearly communicate with somebody that's an emergency. And obviously, I had actually two or three calls this morning. And that's, um, so, so the issue is actually uh, kind of exacerbating itself. And, and uh, so it's, it's not going to be acceptable. Um, we will send out a warning for one unexcused absence, uh, probation for two unexcused absence. And unfortunately, um, we have only had to do this once so far, uh, a dismissal from the program. 
on the third. So please, um, uh, please attend. But more importantly, uh, this whole uh, issue of communication. And I happen to be tracking for the last three seminars. I, you know, I sit down a week or two before and I send out an invitation to the meetings. And I not only send it out to yourselves, I also send it to the operating committee. And then I painstakingly wait for your responses. And uh, the last time we talked about the whole communication issue, I think you remember I had a little whiteboard here and I was talking about communication. I was relating it to the business community. And uh, at, right after I did that, in the March seminar, 80% of you re responded to my invitation for the meeting. Uh, on April the 6th, 50% uh, of you responded, and most recently, less than 45% of you responded to this meeting. And I sent that email out two weeks ago. So I guess um, what I would say is, uh, you, we love treating you like grown-ups. I mean, and, and by the way, your feedback to how we conduct these sessions, asking you to wear business attire, asking you to be on time, uh, having uh, place cards and things like that. You, your feedback, your original feedback about six months ago was, I love this, you're treated like adults. Okay, if you want to be treated like adults, I can tell you that if you're going to only respond to 50% of the communication for the program, or you are going to uh, do those kinds of things on absences or be late or whatever, then that's not very uh, acting like adults. So uh, in a business world, I'm going to take it right back to the business world. Um, what this starts to question is your reliability, uh, whether you're responsible or not, responsibility, uh, whether you have commitment or personal accountability. And I'm not going to do anything except um, the next part of the, what I was going to talk about was we have 10, or 12, 20, 10 to 12 apprenticeships that we're looking at right now. And I'll tell you, when we sit down as an operating committee, and again, there's, 12, there's 14 to 16 people on the operating committee, and I sit with Mr. Gruner and Mr. Sosky. We have a list of all the candidates that want jobs, and we're trying to fit people into jobs. Uh, we are desperately uh, looking for uh, the right jobs for the right people. Uh, you will not be one of the right people if your communication skills are not there. I, I, I don't, it's not a threat, it's just the reality of it. It's just, I have to make sure that if an employer wants to get in touch with you or you are going to accept a position with someone in the Goodyear organization or the Timken organization or Freshmark or Habitat for Humanity or Howard Hanna or it just goes on and on, I have to make sure that you have these communication skills. We're not trying to uh, do anything other than to impress upon you that this is how you act in a professional manner. So, um, I hope I don't have to talk about this again. Um, it's not the most pleasant of conversations, obviously. <clears throat> But the good news is you all have time to make a difference and turn it around. And, you know, I have, some of you have not answered three meeting notices. Some of you answered one. Some of you answered two. And it's kind of, be cognizant that there are people taking the time to care about you and getting you ready for out there, whether it's now, next year, the year after, or the year after that. And by the way, Nice to see you, Zach, and Alec, and Kaylee, our graduates. Nice to see you guys. Hello. Really, uh, it's really good to stand up here and see, see you guys in the audience. Uh, Rihanna uh, was trying to get here today, and uh, it didn't work out. But anyway, that's four out of five. That's, that's, those are good percentages. So anyway, uh, any questions about what I just said as far as communications is concerned? Yes. In what format are we receiving the invitations? Uh, I send you an Outlook. Uh, okay. I send you an Outlook. It's, it's right in Outlook. Okay. Outlook calendar. And uh, 
it was interesting. This is the first time I sent it out two weeks in advance. I did because I was in Charleston uh, last week. We were away, Mrs. D, you know. And it was the first time I sent it two weeks. Usually I sent it a week before. And it was interesting to watch the flow. Um, I actually got two or three this morning, which is, which is okay. But um, uh, I, I asked, in this program, you're going to need to be checking every, at, at minimally once a week, if not every couple of days, okay? Checking your communications and your emails. Any other questions? Okay, um, profiles. Uh, I, unless I'm mistaken, you can tell me right now. Profiles. Uh, I am still looking for uh, uh, Jaquan's. Where are you, Jaquan? Jaquan, I'm still looking for your profile. Uh, Daniel, do I have yours? Do I have your profile? Okay. Would you guys send them to me in an email, please? Colta, do I have your final you uh, should. profile? Would you send it to me again? It, Mrs. Zosky may have it and I may not have it. So okay. if you would send it to me. Miles, do I have your profile? Yeah. Well, could you resend it to me, please? Okay. And uh, Jared's not here. Okay. So if you would do that. Um, the point I'm at at the profiles is, is everyone that uh, we're looking for employment uh, and uh, seniors. I'll be through those now. and. Many juniors I'm through, and uh, believe me, I will get to the rest of you over the summer, and we will we will do it. Uh, I have to tell you the feedback on the profiles is terrific. Some people have said that you know they're pretty sure that it's it's made a difference in looking for a job and employment. Uh, yes, great. I just wanted to mention that I, I used my profiles to get into Boys State this summer, so All right. that was great. Used it to get into uh, Boys State, uh, which is. Uh, an organization for um, actually within the legal field, correct? And uh, he is convinced that it, that it helped him. So uh, once again, that we're doing this uh, to help you out. We, we know this is something that you can use and you're going to need in the future. Um, who here is in Model UN this year? This year, Model UN. Okay, so we're going to be getting to you. Uh, Mr. Slifer, raise your hand, Mr. Slifer. Mr. Slater. He is going to be uh, heading up uh, with Bowie uh, uh, College, and I believe Ms. Turner and who else, Ken, is on model you in? Uh, Ms. Turner so far. Mr. Um, Mr. Mr. Fultz is kind of holding Mr. off a little bit, unless you guys can convince him. We did. Uh, well, we did. He wanted to take a little break from something. He said he was coming back. Everybody piled right Okay, so Mr. Sipek and Mr. Slifer, uh, Mr. Sipek has agreed that he's going to help us, and he's going to help us help you, and we are going to be, we'll be getting back to you on a couple of initiatives to raise some funds for Model UN, okay? Uh, because we think you have a real struggle, and last year um, uh, was a struggle for you, so, so we'll be getting back to you, but that's good news that's on its way. Um, okay, with that, I am going to turn it over to two of your distinguished <laughs> classmates. How's that? Um, this is great. Uh, we've been working on this project for about four months. This is your website. Uh, I have been there s simply from what do you need, um, you know, whether it's pay a small bill to get the internet, the, the web up or the internet up. Uh, or, uh, I don't know, coffee and donuts, whatever they needed, I was there to support them. Uh, getting them a drink of water when they were needed, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but they worked extremely hard. Uh, Summer got tied up, she was, she was on her way, she may, still even may come in. But um, this website is terrific, this is your website. And they need some things from you, and I hope you help them out, because um, they will be moving on. I mean, they'll be the next Kaylee and Zach and Alec, okay, out the door, and you're going to own the website. And this website is key as we go forward. Okay, so Hannah and Matt, go. <laughs> All of that time and you're not ready? I said go. He wants to sit. Oh, he's got to be comfortable. I'm sorry. Of course. All right. You ready? Can we let
like a countdown or something? I feel Watch. like. Okay, you will do it. Three, two. Watch it not work. Okay. Right. <laughs> oh, it's pretty. All right. So Good. this is the long time coming camp website. The address or whatever for it is ECHScamp.com. So it's pretty easy to remember. And then this is our home page. Oh, okay, so I guess that was supposed to talk. Um, across that green bar, you see the scrolling words. It says, next, next camp meeting, June 2014. That's all and, yeah. So, um, <laughs> if by chance we have a cancellation of a meeting, or there's a reason, or something that you guys need to know, that's where you'll find that. Um, like last time, when there was weather, we needed to cancel the meeting. Um, and it was difficult reaching people. So if you're not sure we're going to have a meeting or not, just hop on the website, check that out. Um, across the top, yeah, Hannah's flipping through some of the pictures. Um, those pictures with, whoa, change it. <laughs> those, those pictures, uh, yeah. <laughs> those pictures uh, will change as, the, as time goes on and we get more pictures of you guys. Um, across the top, you see our story, our philosophy, our students, and get in touch. The first one, our story, is just kind of um, a little background on us, on early college. Yeah, sure. And it actually, across, across the top, you see the toolbar, takes you to the About Us page. And there's a little bio of what camp is, what early college is. Um, and then we have a link that'll take you to the courses that all early college students take. Um, the, associates, the Associates of Arts and Associate of Science degrees, those two tracks. Um, you can also go to our philosophy, which is kind of just um, what what camp is about, what we believe. Um, there's a quote: "Professionalism is a frame of mind, not a paycheck." Um, and you know, um, again, a short little bio on that. You guys can read on your own time. <laughs> um, and then we have um, links to the operating committee. In here, we have pictures of. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> members um, and a bio next to their name. So if anyone asks you what's camp, like who, who is involved in camp, you can bring them to the website, show them um, what is the leaders of camp and um, what they do, why they're qualified to um, help us out. And, and then we have the bio of the students. So, so far, we just have a quick little bio for Zach. <laughs> and we have pictures of um, others. So right now, we just have the class of 2013 and the class of 2014. Um, eventually, the rest of you guys, I guess, will put on there. Um, once, we get, once we get pictures and whatever. Um, and then here is really the meat of the, of the site, career paths. Um, this is where you can come. Um, to explore different career paths, different different options um, as you start education. And we have, it's split up into five main categories, arts and humanities, business, health and medicine, public and social services, and STEM. Um, so. I'm working on it. You go to the arts and humanities page. <clears throat> we only have, okay. <laughs> um, on each page, you'll see there'll be a, a box that says careers, one that says resources, and one that says elaborate. Um, the careers box is essentially going to take you um, through different careers that you could get with an education in the arts or an education in business. Um, and then the resources, you can look there, click on those articles. You want to try them? Those are actually articles that will take you to the website of either. Um, I don't know, Canton Rap's website or Monster, <laughs> or um, yeah, lots of different websites, lots of different, lots of different resources that you guys can find there. Um, should I keep going? So Matt, if there's an article we want posted up there, how do you go? How do we go about doing? If that? you want to post an article, I mean, just contact one of us right okay. now. As we pass on these, the duties to future members um, of the website team, they'll be responsible for that. So, um, or, <clears throat> and then attending meetings is critical for the website because just now when Ms. Shear, 
um, when she had those links on. So later on, I'll go post those on the website um, so that you guys can go there to access the, the, the links that she had for her presentation. Um, and so each site oh, has a little different theme. Okay, we can, oh, you can play here. Um, and then this is a box for um, people outside of camp who may not know a lot of details about the program and what we do or what it's all about. What they can do is type in their name, their email address, uh, their address, um, and whatever question they might have or if they want to make a comment. Um, and that'll go directly to Mr. Venturello right now. No, it goes directly to... Oh, never mind, I lied. It goes to, we created a camp um, email. email address. And then go to that. And whoever needs to see the question will see the question, and that person will get a response. So if parents want to... What's that? Is there more contact information going to be put on the board of directors? For the outcome, yeah. I mean, yeah, as, as we get that, it'll be posted. Sure. Yeah. Um, <coughs> If you guys have questions about anything, just say anything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's a question. Jada has a question. Jada has a question. So how do we get on, the, on board with YouTube to help out? Oh, awesome question. We'll get to that. Good. You're, you're, you're awesome. All right. Actually, we made a job and when we were writing out the job titles, right? I got them. All right. Um, the best page on the website. Best page on the website. <laughs> Skilled camp. So, oh, are we, I don't, okay, so uh, you guys know about, the, there might, there's another, okay. Just move on. <laughs> it's for a future website um, for, a, for a sister program. Okay. Um, I don't know. Okay. And then here are the well, student resources. Do you, you want to um, spend... Ten seconds, Mr. We're going to tell them about the Skill Camp and what we're trying to do. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind. Sure. Skill Camp is technical Te camp. Technical camp. Technical, 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 technical camp. camp. Oh. And the idea yeah, behind it is to work. Me. And I, I think I've been advertising this inside of the lunchroom. And uh, we have uh, a team teacher that's working with uh, Ms. Myers, and it's Mr. Uh, Longenecker. He's the one that's the high school connection that is uh, helping to spearhead this to start it up. We're looking at ten to twelve members to be a part of it. We're working with 10th graders up to 12th grade. Uh, the requirements for getting in is not as stringent as the ones here. We have a 3.0. This one is a 2.2 GPA. A strong interest in the engineering field, uh, computer-related field, mathematic field. Any of those students that would like to uh, get into one of those sort of skilled areas to go ahead and work and find out more information about it, this is for them. And uh, we did have a couple of students from here that were actually interested in that. But uh, it is supposed to work in conjunction with this program. They will be meeting once a month. There will be some times where there's a, like a, a joint program where it's an interest of all students that will all meet together. But uh, most of those meetings are going to be separate because some of the things that they are going to be talking about is going to be specific to them as opposed to what we have with you. So we have taken in some applications. The deadline for it was just this past week. We're going to be looking through those and, and bringing those students on board. So it's going to be very similar to this, but it's going to be targeted toward the mathematical, engineering, and computer-related fields for those kids that are interested in, students that are interested in. So that's what that last page will be. It'll just basically be a quick bio to that program, and then a link to their website. They're going to have a separate website. Um, you see Hannah logging in. Everybody today, you guys are going to make logins for the website. And um, there's a section of the website that has more um, sensitive information about each of us, so like our bios or whatever, and um, more camp meeting dates and places and time. And so you guys are all going to make a login today. Um, yeah, we'll figure that out. Um, and so the first thing you see when you get to that page, once you log in, um, you see a calendar of events. So not only will it be a calendar with our meeting dates, it'll also have volunteer opportunities, graduations, anything, any important dates that, stu that students are going to need in it. Um, um, do you have access into this? Do, can you update this yourself too? Or do we have to go through Matt and the group? Uh, I have access to it, but it, the updates are going to be through the web, website team. Okay. Yeah. So for the next month or two, it'll, it'll still be Matt and Hannah, and then they'll be bringing on board. Matt's going to get to that in a minute, uh, some, other, some other help. Okay. So. 
All right, and then we have the speaker bio. So here, um, the names are linked to the bios that, they, that we hand out for, or that they hand out for each um, speaker. It's there. You can just, <laughs> you can go in, click on it, find it. If you lost paper, print it out, do what you have to do. Um, so just another resource for you. Seminar handouts, same thing. 